All right, guys, thanks again for your attention. It's been a great discussion and a, lo a lot of great comments. So uh, I'm going to talk about full endoscopic uh, posterior lateral uh, facet sparing fusion today. Uh, I started my endoscopic sort of interest just doing discectomies and for degenerative discogenic back pain. Then I went into herniated disc. And then I'm like, wow, this is, you know, to do, the, to, do the, to do a fusion would be that much more complicated. So then I worked with a couple of companies to develop a couple of cages and uh, came up with a, a nice sort of MIS um, alternative. So we talked about this case this morning. It's apropos. 83-year-old, right? We talked about these 80-year-olds with bad bones. Uh, what are we going to do with these patients, right? You know, the whole global concept of costs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, normal body mass index, she's got a unilateral back, unilateral leg pain. Uh, she's got a scoliotic deformity. Again, I get full length films on all my uh, patients before I operate on them, especially these older patients that I'm thinking about MIS. MIS is not the magic bullet for everybody, especially if you're dealing with a deformity. So if you have a major deformity, you've got to figure out where is this deformity, and can I treat it focally or can I not treat it focally? If I can't treat it focally, then I'm not going to do an MIS, but if I can, I'm going to try. Uh, so now I've got a scoliosis, a spondylolisthesis, and I've got spinal stenosis, right? This is her MRI. So she's got mainly left-sided leg pain from that far lateral subarticular disc. She doesn't have a lot of right-sided leg pain. Uh, good maintenance of her disc. That's case one. This is case two. We talked about this lady too, right? By BMI over 35, right? 42. She had a previous uh, fusion. You can see the scar in the back. I didn't do this uh, procedure before, uh, but she had a fusion. She had her hardware removed, and then now she has an adjacent level uh, issue at the four or five level. Large person, right? So what do you want to do with this lady? Okay, so keep those two things in the back of your head. From an indications perspective, I think you need to really, from a stenosis, spinal stenosis uh, concept, you need to kind of really understand what you're dealing with. Do you have central stenosis or do you have lateral stenosis? These are two different animals, right? Lateral stenosis, I think, is a great MIS uh, uh, procedure for, whether it's re lateral recess or foraminal. I'll treat those patients with MIS surgery all day long. Central stenosis, somewhat different. Sometimes I'll do MIS with some additional posterior work if I need to. It just depends on what I have. And so this is sort of the algorithm that I have. If I have central stenosis, it's going to be more interlaminar. It might still be MIS-ish, but it's going to be a little bit more direct decompression because that's the most important thing here is getting the patient decompressed. If it's a lateral stenosis, I'll treat these patients mostly with MIS techniques, as I'll show you in a second. I think the advantages of the endoscopic technique, especially endoscopic, is say versus a mini open or you know, tubular MIS, right? The same, it's the same incision for every patient, right? I, I know when I walk into the uh, operating room on Tuesday morning, if I have a big, small, I don't even think about the BMI anymore because it's irrelevant for me. If um, I used to do these with tubes or I used to do them open, it was very relevant because <laughs> the angle to get your uh, T lift cage in is very difficult if it's an open and a tubular incision. I think the muscle blood supply preservation to the facet is critical. When we do an open or a tubular decompression, we're destroying the facet completely, number one. And number, and number two, you're disrupting the whole blood supply to that pars area, which is your segmental artery, which is your entire blood supply to that facet joint region. Uh, infection rates, I think, are lower. You can leverage your indirect and indirect and direct decompressions, and I'll show you in a second why. Uh, and you're not destabilizing the spine whatsoever. So I use unilateral pedicle screws on all my cases, pretty much on these uh, patients, unless there's like an extreme osteoporotic issue. So uh, I'm not going to belabor the concept of MIS and why it's you know, really important, but the evolution pretty much now is at the endoscopic level. So if you can uh, get to this uh, technique, you'll be a true MIS surgeon uh, uh, you know, in your armamentarium. Why is it such a great thing? Because, you know, the, the, the scopes these days, the lighting, the tools you have, the access that gives you uh, is tremendous. Uh, you, if you have to understand the foraminal anatomy very well, though, uh, because, again, you're operating in a very small space, and it's easier to do this, obviously, open or MIS, um, tubular. Uh, but if you understand the anatomy carefully, you can do this. So this is my uh, incision for every patient. It's a centimeter. And depending upon where the target is, like that lady I just showed you, the 83-year-old, I'm going to come in at maybe a 60-degree angle. If I have a central um, area of stenosis that I have to deal with, I'm going to come in a little bit more horizontal. These tools, um, the articulating burr, 
uh, the, the laser that's actually used for the right purpose, not laser spine stuff, not all that marketing stuff, but a laser that's actually used for decompression purposes is highly valuable. And I'll show you that in a second. Uh, down the road very soon, there's going to be endoscopic ultrasonic bur uh, bone cutters, very similar to the bone cutters that you're using these days. Uh, the scalpel, the bone scalpel for laminectomies, will have these available in this scope to do your um, burring. So again, big, small, narrow, wide, I don't care. All these patients get the same incision. Again, anatomy is going to be critical uh, to understanding what you're doing. If you have a big overhang facet, you got to deal with that first, right? So you don't become too lateralized. You have to kind of you know, do a little small foraminoplasty, get into the disc, and then work from there. Uh, understanding your MRI is very critical in these situations. You know, do you have a type A? Is it unifocal or multifocal? Um, and if it's, you know, multifocal is actually really nice for um, endoscopic because you can come in at different angles and take care of the, the disc, multiple disc herniations with one approach rather than having to do a midline approach, a lateral approach, you know, all those things. Endoscopic, you can get this all with one approach. It's very nice. So uh, I mentioned the indirect decompression before. And after I do my direct decompression with my endoscopic uh, uh, surgery, I will then prepare the end plates, and then I'll use an expandable cage of some type. I like the expandable cages because you can reduce the lordosis, uh, you can you know, reduce the spondylolisthesis, and increase your foraminal height very nicely, just like with a posterior approach, but you can get the cage uh, a little bit more anteriorly and a little more horizontal at times. So this is kind of a picture that I have here showing the, in, the direct decompression with the scope. So I'm going to get rid of that far lateral disc herniation because I'm going to dock right on that with my, my cannula. I'm going to do a slight resection of that facet with a burr. That'll be easy. And then I'm going to add my cage. And when I add the cage, I'm going to reduce my uh, spondylolisthesis and reduce, increase my foraminal volume. Uh, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details on how to actually place your needles and do your approach and things like that. But just, you know, you're going to need to learn to do this. It's, it takes a little bit of time. It's not like uh, a one day kind of cadaver lab thing. Um, you have to know where to put, place your needles and uh, all your landmarks and things like that and how to get your guide in. And then once you get it in, then you're going to work through this, this cannula and all your work's done through this tube. It's really simple. Disk space preparation. Um, can you play this video for me? So this is, um, and then go to, let's see, there's an articulating burr. Go to like uh, three minutes into it for me. Uh, it's a little too far. They went too far. Go back. Yeah, right there. Okay, so now I see my end plates. They're uh, bleeding. Uh, go back a little bit more for me. There. Okay, you see the end plates? So now I've got bleeding end plates. Superior and inferior end plates are bleeding. What I'll do next is I'll back out my cannula, and I'll make sure that I have enough space in my disc space uh, for my cage. So you can kind of see. Yeah, there. So now I'm backing out the cannula. My traversing nerve root is right above me. You can see it at 12 o'clock. Uh, so I'll resect that last little bit of uh, annular uh, fiber just to get to make sure I'm that my nerve root is completely decompressed ventrally. And once I have the ventral decompression, kind of speed it up to like uh, three quarters done there. Yeah, right there, that's good. Uh, a little bit more. There you go. So now I'm just going to resect. You can see me resecting that posterior uh, annulus and disc material away from the nerve root. And now I know that when I put my cage in, I'm not going to push any disc material up into the canal. Right? Some people will do this blindly. I don't think that's a great idea. OK, next slide. I think that's me. OK, so end plate preparation, good bleeding bone. Right? OK, so this is that case again, 83-year-old female. And um, you know, there are a lot of different options for this. I don't think an 83-year-old ALIF is probably your best idea. Um, you know, could you do this uh, with a, uh, a tube? Sure. Could you do it open? Sure. Uh, but we do this awake, local anesthetic, IV sedation. Very little trauma to the patient from an um, anesthetic perspective. And I put two, K two screws in one bar. And you can see, if you really look at the deformity and where the focus of your apex of your deformity is, and you Look, critically look at your films, you can get a tremendous reduction of your scoliosis, your spondylolisthesis, and your stenosis with a small cage, 
two screws and a rod in an hour and a half local awake anesthetic, right? And I think this is correct. Yep, IV sedation. I use the guide wire in jam sheety. So there's no muscle, really not a lot of muscle uh, destruction in the back. So it's not that painful for the patient. Propofol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll use propofol when the screws are going in, but basically for the rest of the case, it's, you know, Versed, fentanyl, things that I can reverse. So Versed, fentanyl. Uh, propofol I don't use unless we're putting the screws in. You can reverse Versed, you can reverse fentanyl. And then I, you throw in some Presidex. The Presidex is really nice. It's kind of like a, a ketamine. And they um, don't remember much at all. <laughs> No, you don't need to. I can do these asleep just as easy as I can do them awake. With a younger patient that I'm not too worried about anesthesia and all that other stuff, I put them asleep. I use neuromonitoring, uh, and the success is just as high, and the complications are just as low. Um, what do you use for bone grafts? So, yeah, so that's a good question. So I think, you know, in this case, for a patient that's asleep, I'll use a, a bone marrow aspirate or awake, right? I'll just get some bone marrow aspirate from the crest. Take that, and then I use a, a, the PRPP we looked at this morning. So I have a PRPP, they spin the PRPP down, it's very soft. I mix that with the aspirate. I put that in front of the cage, and you can put some um, very simple allograft, like toothpaste, it'll go down the tube and you just push it down. You want something soft, not too hard. You don't want chunks of, of cancellous bone, right? Pack that in front of your cage, put your cage in, and then I'll add a posterior lateral graft to the, I'll use a um, burr to. Um, you can, uh, for the bone graft or for the, for the screws, for the screws, correct. Yeah, you're done, you're done with the endoscopic. Yeah, you're done, exactly. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. Yes, so that's the thing. So 11.9% dysesthesia, which is temporary, usually three or four weeks, so it's about 12%. But it's usually just a tingling numbness kind of thing. I've never had like a foot drop, a, a quad paresis. I've never had things like that. Now, there are some cases that, you're, like I talked about before, where you have like a gigantically huge facet that stops you from getting into the Camden's triangle because it's overlying Camden's triangle. You have to be either, number one, Technically, uh, te uh, technically capable of resecting that facet, or you just don't do it. You have to understand those limitations. This talk doesn't have, I don't have a lot of time to go into all those things, but you're right, you have to be careful. But in, you know, from a procedural perspective, uh, especially when they're awake, the chance of a, of a nerve root issue is really low. But I use spinal cord monitoring on the patients that are asleep too. Uh, like nervous patients or a bigger guy that I know is going to want to move around a lot, right? I put them asleep, general anesthetic, TIVA, you know, for spinal cord monitoring. Now, let me say a follow-up question. We talk about this one about quality and value and cost. Mm-hmm. Monitoring is super expensive. Yes, it can be. So something that you can do with the MIST lip, now you're increasing the cost, you know, how much? Yeah. Yeah, so you have to be careful on your global, and if you're at a if you're at your surgery center or at your hospital, and kind of like understand where you're at and what the costs are. I've got the cost of monitoring down now. I cap it at three hours for the for my for my own institution, right? So at three hours, it's a capped amount. How much is that? It's like twelve hundred bucks. Well, Medicare is a little bit different because they don't have the capitated. I mean, they don't have the. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like a, a big deal for us. It's not a cost for Medicare. It's not a huge deal. Uh, yes, one. Well, two if you use the burr. So you have a bipolar, an endoscopic bipolar, and then you have the articulating burr. But what's the outlay of the instrumentation, right? So you have to get that specialized. Oh yeah, there's always a startup cost. It depends. Now some some some. Like Eloquence, other companies that have cages will, will just basically donate the scope stuff for you now. So you don't actually come up. The cost to get a scope set is about 90000 That would be a one-time, you know, upfront cost for it. If 
you're at, it just depends on what company you have to deal with. The benefit of this versus, I don't do an MIS, so uh -huh. I'm just naive. The benefit of doing this versus putting a tube down a smaller tractor. It depends on the body habitus. For me, I mean, for this, it's nice because I'm not taking the facet down. I'm not making the patient rotationally unstable, right? So I don't need, say, four screws. Yeah. And I found that you're replacing that facet with a screw and a rod, so it's actually stronger than the facet you took down. So yeah. As long as you're not destabilizing the other side or exposing the other side, yeah. you haven't, you know, by putting the rod and screw in on that side, you yeah. have stabilized as stronger than what you had there before. Yeah. And I love the, when I, I'll show you this, here's a post-op CT. So this is a, a post-op CT at four months. You see the post here. But also, this is a lady that had bilateral pars defects, right? Unilateral screws. And you look at the side that we operated on, you know, versus the side we didn't. Your, the fusion rates that I'm getting with this across those facets, the intact facets, is really high. So not only am I getting the fusion across the inner body, but my, my facet fusion is higher. So I'm getting a, I have almost a dual guarantee, if you will, of some type of one of the two fusion masses happening, whether it's the anterior and or the posterior, because I'm preserving that posterior facet, which is a really nice you know, area for fusion, because it's usually bone on bone. These facets are usually trash, right? So. You don't keep, I don't even see it. I don't even look at that facet. I don't touch it. But I mean, as opposed to, wouldn't it be nice to put a drill bar straight through it so it fuses for you? Oh, you think you would. You think you would have to, but you don't. I don't think. I mean, at least in the case, this is why I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised because I'm not, that capsule, all that tissue, the bleeding, that blood supply is totally preserved. That muscle tissue is preserved. All that, and that's the most important thing. You can have a, you know, bone on bone, perfect looking, uh, opposed bony, but if you don't have it bleeding, if you don't have that the preservation of the soft tissue, you may not get the fusion. But anyway, let me keep moving ahead. Um, and this just shows you again the cage, you know, the pars defect. And then this is that larger lady that we did, right? So this lady has the bone marrow aspirate, one band aid there. She has a band aid for my endoscopic approach and a band aid for the two screws. So these are the incisions I do for that big, large patient, right? And it's just basically the same approach. And this is another reason why I don't like doing the tubular T-lifts, right? Because the tubular T-lifts, trying to get that cage in there and getting your angle, is just really hard. This is really simple for me. Uh, for me to do this, to get into the disc is about maybe six minutes. To prep the disc space is another, say, 15 minutes. Uh, to aspirate the bone is about five minutes. So to do the, the, the preparation with the cage and, the, and all that's probably about an hour, maybe under an hour. And then I add the two pedicle screws. Well, what are you trying to are you using the pedicle screws? I know, uh, basically, I'll take a, my finger and I'll take a sin frame. You know a sin frame? There's a sin frame blade with a handle. I use a sin frame blade and a handle, right? And I use that to decorticate. I see my TPs and I put my screws in. A lot of times, this is just percutaneous. I have two wires. I put the wires in first. I make my incision after I put my wires in, and then I go down and I look at the two TPs. Or if I don't want to do that, see, I'm really happy, and I don't need to do, the, do that. I'll just put the screws in and put the, the rod over the, you know, percutaneously. So I'm not even opening it. You follow me? Yeah, because this, if they're awake, I don't want to make a big incision and go down there with my finger with the retractor, you know what I mean? I'll just put the two, I'll put the two wires, put my screws, and then put my screw right through that. So these are the outcomes. Um, we recently published uh, our 51 um, patient cohort, uh, over two year follow up, uh, showing the uh, different levels from L2 down to S1. These are our VAS scores, both back, uh, back and leg. This is our ODI uh, scores, again, minimum 24 months. This is uh, Mike Wang's group. Now, he's, this is 100 patients, uh, minimum one year follow up. All of these patients he did awake. I would say 
25% of the patients that we did were awake. The rest of them were asleep. You can. Your anesthesiologist. You have to have a really good working relationship with your anesthesiologist. So, yeah. So we'll intubate. In a, we'll intubate in a prone position. Actually, we'll use a. Yeah, we'll use a uh, LMA in the prone position if the patient has an airway issue or something like that. You got. It, it's not for every anesthesiologist. Believe me. Okay. So uh, how about about in, uh, impediments? Right. So you, you never. There's never a golden ticket for everything. So impediments would be, you know, you have to know your anatomy. You can't come in at very horizontal angles at all levels. You have to know where your retroperitoneum is. Uh, you know, you don't want to go ahead and put your cannulas in and then go through your liver. Or on the opposite side is your, do I have a laser here? So on the opposite side uh, is your kidney, your ureter over there, and your intestine. So if you come in at an angle too steep, uh, you could, you know, hurt your viscous or vascular structures, just like with any open or any other spinal technique that we were talking about, like the lateral. You just have to know your anatomy pretty carefully. Okay, sorry to go over time, um, but that's sort of like my most recent experience with the uh, MIS world. Thank you.